Hello, darling. <laughs> I'm back again. Second YouTube video ever. This is a lot more settled than last time, actually, energy-wise. <laughs> this time is a fun one. I've basically structured uh, meditation, guided visualisation, daydream, imaginative journey, whatever you want to call it, really. You could even call it a rampage if you're into that sort of stuff. Um, I've structured three of those in a completely random way using tarot cards so that you guys can have a period of daydream, a period of imagination in your day where things that you're trying to make come about can just flow through your body and you can feel the feelings of having those things in a way that isn't blocked by you anticipating what's coming next. And this came about because I interrupted my own daydream this week and then I was really annoyed about that. It struck me that having guilt about doing something as frivolous as daydreaming shouldn't occur when your focus is imaginative work, when your focus is myth, archetype, when the work that I do every day is to do with helping people using story. And yet there was still this societal thing that I was carrying with me in my subconscious somewhere that was loud enough to shout at me when I was daydreaming, at a time when contextually that was appropriate. I'd done my work, I'd seen the people I needed to see. It was fine to be just going off as I do and fantasizing about a wonderful thing. I guess I, I don't want you guys to have that same experience. And if there are any of you out there struggling with giving yourself permission to daydream, to be imaginative, that kind of thing, I want to let this reading be a way for you to have 10 or so minutes, probably longer. I haven't checked the timestamps actually. Uh, let's call it 30, just to be on the safe side. But to have a stretch of time where you're allowed to just feel things, pick up sensations, have your mind make stuff pop up for you and generate an energy and momentum and a sense of well-being in your body through doing that. If you're coming from a non-manifesting, atheistic perspective, see it as a, a form of self-motivation and um, it's a funny phrase, but a form of self-pleasure that you can return to in order to get yourself to an equilibrium. Something I would also love with this particular one is if anybody who's gone through the visualizations could come back, tell me what kind of things they were receiving, feeling, seeing, um, and if we could have a bit of an exchange about what each pile got so that we can make these into kind of mimetic imaginary spaces that we can build upon and revisit if we ever want to put more power into that particular area of life. I believe the sound on this is okay, but I was in a room where I was aware that there was traffic noise. So because of the nature of the videos, I'm going to try and control that as much as possible and edit it as much as possible or as much as I know how. But if there is any bus noise, car noise, anything like that, I am truly sorry. As with all of the videos I'm going to do, I'm new. This is my second time on YouTube ever. Please, please, please share, like, subscribe, ding the dong, thank you kindly. I know I shouldn't have to say it. I know it's irritating, but I'm brand new brand brand new. I really hope you enjoy it. I loved filming this one. I really did. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for giving me that experience and have a very wonderful imaginative daydreamy day. Hey guys, welcome back. So this is your choice of piles for the daydream that you're going to experience. We've got pile one, pile two and pile three. Um, and they're all quartz crystals. I wanted to use quartz today because it's a kind of uh, natural amplifier of whatever your existing energy is. And I feel like there are different options, but you guys are essentially kind of going to tell me through the cards what you need to have your daydream about. So it's important that I amplify the existing energy and, and don't put crystals down, which are kind of imposing something onto these. 
Um, quartz is also an excellent purifier and it's very energetic and strong. So it's a good neutral stone actually to put under your pillow if you're dreaming dreaming or a good one to carry with you if you're daydreaming. The only other kind of form of companion we've got today is uh, Labradorite. I always want to say Labradorite because I imagined it as like a a big kind of bounding iridescent doggo. Um, but it's very much a third eye dreaming, visualising, concentrating and going off into unknown spaces kind of a stone. So this is going to act as our kind of gateway. It doesn't have a name yet. <laughs> None of these kind of smaller crystals do. So as with last time, if you want to give them names like the big guys have, feel free. Let me know in the comments. In terms of the decks that we're working with today, we've got the Vertigo Tarot because it's Neptunian Dreamlight. One image fades into another in that very organic way that you get when you're doing visualisations. Um, we've got the Secret Language of Colour cards, which are going to provide a hue for us for the daydream because I think it's very good to visually anchor whatever you're thinking about so that you've got a place to return to and you can remember it by colour, or at least for me because I'm quite a visual person. And then we've also got the archetype cards. Each daydream will have a spirit or a person or, or some other contact involved. And these will let me know who that is. And then I can sort of guess where we're going along the way. So take a moment, get into a dream space, have a think about the kinds of thing you'd love to bring into your life through dreaming and manifesting and I will see you when you're ready to dream. Pile one, hello. I'm just going to pop this on here. These little cards are my homemade uh, dream subject cards so this will reveal what it is that you're dreaming about. I haven't seen these, I don't know what the combinations are, so I'm excited as you are really. <laughs> so your dream will be about love. <laughs> okay, so the first card is a signifier of you, and then we're going to get a colour, and then from there it's just going to be the journey, and I have a loose structure that I'm going to use for that, but kind of generally speaking, it's up to you whether you want to sit down and listen and kind of meditate through it now. Or if you think that my voice is the kind of thing that will be distracting and you prefer to hear the full story of the daydream and then go off and add nuances to it later. If you do, by all means, comment as to what your different unexpected elements of the daydream looked like. Because as I said in the intro, I would like us to swap dreams and share dreams and really build on our visualisation skills together as a community. So, representing you, we have the Three of Wands. I'm just going to pop that over this side. I hope you can see that. So I'm feeling instantly that you're in a place of being a kind of creative entrepreneur or looking ambitiously at a project that you've kind of set off information you've put out there and you're just letting it go and seeing where it goes to and that there's a, a certain level of anxiety with this but you are looking forward you're looking to travel you're looking to expand it's a very expansive card and also from this and from the subject I see that you are carrying a torch for somebody <laughs> if not one and three or you're holding a kind of passion for something in yourself that's you want perfect passionate love to enter your life or you want to build on it where it is in your life and that's what today's daydream is going to be about so the hue of your daydream will be oh rose <laughs> attract a relationship so perhaps you are single or perhaps you're in a relationship that isn't fulfilling you on a deep level and you're looking today to think about what you might draw in, what your fantasy partner would be like, what the experience of meeting them might be like for you. 
Rose is a very interesting colour to pick for a daydream because as well as the kind of um, implications for the deep sacred feminine and, and for um, femininity and witchcraft and, and for love and love magics and all that sort of, you know, extensive history in that and in art and everything like that, you've also got rose in the modern sense of wearing rose-tinted glasses. And I do feel for you that it's important not to take those off and not to be dissuaded in what's going to happen for you. Um, if you look at the world in a rose-tinted way, you're going to have more success with bringing this into your life than if you were to tell yourself to be more realistic, which often, unfortunately, in today's interactions, that often translates to more pessimistic, and that's not the sort of energy we need to be in, right? Okay, so I want you to imagine yourself for a moment in a space that is rose tinted and where you can see rosy tones coming out in the things around you. And this space for you, the place you're at, is a party. You're surrounded by friends and they're sharing glasses of drinks and there's a feast somewhere, a gigantic feast, all this delicious food on a table and pretty much everybody you love is gathered around it and they're talking and they're laughing and interacting on a level that delights you at a really deep level that there's no conflict between any of them and even people who haven't come across each other before or who have different value systems they're all speaking to each other in such a reverent and deeply satisfied way and you know that to some extent that's because you carry this kind of satisfaction with you into this experience. You're already feeling that you have this rose-tinted life and that the situation is very opulent, very satisfactory for everybody. And you're looking at all these people you know fondly and you're looking from one person to the next and taking in just how much love you have for each and every individual present and how much love there is in your life and in your experience. And I want you to look around at all the food and the drink and all the things to do that are on offer and all the people talking and realise just how much is available to you all the time. And you rarely get moments like this where you can stop and just kind of roll over in the appreciation of it. <laughs> and to take in each face with absolute love. And know that you belong here and with these people and in this setting. And that it is time to throw a party, it's time to celebrate how far you've come and these deep relationships that you already have. And it's time to live deliciously, to, to enjoy each other's company. And as you're looking around, louder and louder in the background, you can hear a song that you like by a female singer who's feisty and fiery and unrelentingly creative in a way that's always kind of secretly inspired you or not so secretly inspired you you are amongst friends <laughs> but her vibrancy and her forthright dedication to craft and her changeability and mutability as well in her creative endeavours and just her fire, the fire in the way that she makes music is so appealing to you and strikes you as so perfect to have in this daydream that actually it makes such sense that that's the thing that you're hearing right now. This powerful woman who's always 
taken your hand and led you a little bit further than you were prepared to go by yourself. What a lovely thing to hear while you're seeing all these people you love. And at the same time you can hear that. You see just off to your right that there's a roaring fire that some of these people are gathered round. And you could suddenly smell the flames and the charcoal, the burning wood, the deep smokiness of it. But then underneath that, there's another smell that's sort of a little bit cinnamony, a little bit frankincense, maybe a touch of sandalwood. You can't quite place what the smell is, but it's a deep warming smell, more warming even than the fire. And if you had to describe it, you'd call it a kingly smell. It's very regal, very opulent, very masculine, but in a deeply peaceful way. It's kind of like the smell that you get in temples or churches, old churches, really old. <laughs> or in the halls where incredibly powerful people used to live in antiquity. It's a really ancient smell and it's very spicy and a little bit sweet and it wafts towards you from the charcoal smokiness and again it strikes you as perfect to go with this beautiful music and these wonderful friends that are gathered around you in this place there's a feeling of enrichment and actually as the smell kind of hits your palate and as you differentiate it from the smokiness of the charcoal and the fire, you close your eyes with the sheer joy of it. And when you do, the smell transforms on your tongue into a kind of sequence of tastes, almost as if different patches of your mouth taste different to each other, picking up different notes in the scent. And each one of these, when your eyes are closed, feels like a different colour. There's like a synesthetic vibrancy to this smell, as if your mouth is full of rainbows, full of different patches of vividness. And I want you to enjoy for a moment just experiencing the sheer variety in that taste, in that smell. and to move through the colours, the one at the side of your tongue, the back of your tongue, the back of your front teeth. It's an odd sensation, but it's there and it's really, truly bright. And the colour that you linger on in these kind of colour tastes is a deep magenta that starts to become a little desaturated and fade as the smell and the taste fades a little. And as it does, it becomes rose, the colour of your favourite roses. And that is your favourite part. So the feeling of all this in your body suddenly is reflective of this deep love you have for your friends and your family and this deep appreciation for music and for smell and for taste and colour and I want you to experience that physical sensation of gratitude and of love and I want you to realise at a deep muscular level that this is indicative of a flowing to and from you of abundance that you kind of always have enough and it's not just the opulence of where you are and the feast that awaits you and the conversation that will no doubt go on to the early hours 
it's the love that comes in and out of you with such ease and such deliciousness and such clarity and that love as a physical sensation is starting to build and build as if it's going to reach some kind of crescendo it's starting to feel more and more intense and the realisation that comes with it is the fact that you don't have to hoard love or save love or stash away memories of love or try desperately to observe love in other people because you always have an unlimited supply of love that flows into you and through you and back out into the world through the kind of prism of rosiness that you provide. And the awareness of that, building and building and building, becomes almost overwhelming. And as you're reveling in that sensation and in all the other sensations, somebody walks into the room. And if you had to describe this person's presence, it's an odd one because you'd call them regal, but you'd also call them your companion. There's a sense of complete loyalty to you, of complete familiarity with you, of a wave of emotion. And the silhouette of this person reminds you of pictures from old fairy tales, of knights on horses, that sort of bigness round the shoulders is mirrored in their clothes. But there's also a femininity in their face, a beautiful femininity in their jaw and in the way that their hair falls and in the gracefulness with which they move. And they strike you, honestly, as perfect. But as they're walking in, they kind of look up and their eyes meet you. And rather than any reaction of surprise or astonishment in the same way that you have for them, they smirk. <laughs> and there's a deep familiarity between you, as if you've been friends forever, through all time, through all possible incarnations, through all possible scenarios. It's like they've been by your side at every point and always will be. And the difference is that now in this room, they're here with you. And they knew it was gonna happen, and you knew it was gonna happen. And now that it has, the feeling of it has the same warmth and opulence and deep, deep connection as that smell that you could smell, that temple sensation. It has the same richness and variety to it as the taste with all the colours in it. And it has the same reassuring and enlivening quality as the music you were listening to and the friendships that you looked on with love. What you feel from this person, really, is a mirror of your own deep sense of appreciation for the present moment. It's like them looking at you is an affirmation that everything is as it should be. And you know that they're there to see you and that they're going to walk towards you. But you also know how they work already. <laughs> and it would never be as simple as that because they're reveling just along with you in the anticipation of that companionship. So what they do instead is walk around the edges of where you are <laughs> and they speak 
to every friend. They introduce themselves, they laugh, they pick at the food, they have a little bit of a drink here and there, and all the while they look up and they check on you and they smile. And you both know that they're just doing the rounds before they come to you. But actually, the experience is so much more satisfying for the fact that you get to watch them take their time. And you get to watch them interact in nuanced little ways. And you get to be delighted by the way that their hands move as they're speaking to others and how animated their expression is and how their eyebrows <laughs> fluctuate with every tiny little bit of emotion that crosses their face. And you get to giggle to yourself at just how delightful they are. And you get to know that they wouldn't be delaying things like this unless there was already a deep sense of love. A knowledge that this will be the relationship of your lifetime and that whatever form it may take and wherever it takes place and whatever happens to both of you while you're in it it is that for both of you and it is the companionship that a part of you has always been seeking and actually there is the awareness that you've never really been without this person and that the illusion of loneliness or of void or of a kind of empty space to fill was just because you couldn't appreciate before that they were already there that everywhere you walk they kind of walk with you and that every corner you turn you just might bump into them again so I want you to watch them now as they continue to make the rounds and they reach kind of the end of their little pathway, their little zigzag towards you. And as they do that, and they look up and they lock eyes with you, I want you to be aware that this feeling like you're on holiday or you're taking a break from regular life or you're indulging somehow in something that isn't like the rest of your reality, this is how it's going to feel every day with this person and that's why they've come to you and that's why you've come to them because daydreamer you make them feel exactly the same way and this deep appreciation and this bubbling joyfulness inside you and this relaxation in your muscles and this sense of excitement and this sense of victory is exactly how you make them feel and on top of that, when you're a little closer to each other and you can feel that crackle, that chemistry between you, that irresistible distance of touch, the anticipation that they'll be closer to you, it strikes you that the sensuality of this moment and the fact that you can so fully be in your body and so fully experience how they look and how they smell and how they sound and what it's like waiting for them to just touch you. That deep longing, that sense of being tied to them somehow and the joy of it, the joy of it not quite yet happening. That is what you'll carry with you when you don't dream anymore. And that will be the first sign that the corner that you're about to turn is the one that they're stood behind. You are inextricably linked and you only have to return to a sense of appreciation for your existing relationships and of appreciation for nature and for visual and audio indulgences and and a feeling of sexiness and a feeling of earthiness you only have to come back to that and it's like a call 
to this companion. So as I finish what I'm saying now, I want you to finish your interaction with them. I want you to pause this and continue to stand with them in that moment, just before you touch, just before you speak to each other. And while you're waiting to see what surprising and new thing they're going to say to you, what message they have to give you, I want you to realize just how wonderful everything can be. Hello, Pile 2. Welcome to the Dream Temple. <laughs> this little white card here will tell me what kind of daydream you've ordered, whether or not you're conscious of it. <laughs> and then we have the Vertigo Tower for you with its Neptunian vibes. This top card will tell me who you are, who I'm reading for, something about you. And then we'll get a colour, a hue to bring through your dream. And then from there, it'll be a sequence of your daydream. Now you can go about this in two ways. You can either listen to me speak and close your eyes and have your little dream time now. Or if you think that my voice might be distracting or that kind of some of the surrounding noise might be too much, you can listen to the story that I tell you and then you can go away and you can daydream in private, which is fine too. I'm just gonna pop this on here. So, the dream that you've ordered is about liberation. Wow, okay, cool, that's a, a good choice. <laughs> and what I'm getting for you is the lovers. So you're a person with an important choice to make at the moment and it's a choice that's potentially divided you into two selves or made you feel like you don't know where you stand on an issue. There are two paths you could go down and they seem like complete opposites and you're trying to find a way to compromise or to integrate the two things and a way to free yourself from this sense of division as well because in this liberation theme I'm sensing that the reconciling, the third option of the lovers, the third person on the card in a traditional deck, which would be the angel, the kind of existence of a triplicate in every binary is something that would be really healing for you. So let's work on that in this daydream. It may go down some funny roads. There may be things that happen that are unexpected. That's the nature of dreams and dream language. Roll with it, see what you reckon. And if you do enjoy it, and if there are little nuances that pop up that I'm not describing and that you didn't expect, then feel free to comment them and to exchange with other people. Because like I said in the intro, it would be delicious if we could all swap dreams and live each other's dreams to the extent that we can and reinforce these dream spaces so that the kind of mental magic of them builds up in power almost like a meme but a, a much more positive version <laughs> okay so the color we'll be working with before we start your daydream oh is lemon wow beautiful 
So there's a very mercurial energy here. There's the lover's card is traditionally associated with Mercury and Gemini anyway. And then lemon is sort of very fast moving. It helps with concentration. It helps with articulation and with verbal and, and breath work. And as it says here, it's uh, accessing innovative thinking as well. So I think liberation for you will partly mean thinking around the choice that's in front of you at the moment, whether it's a choice between jobs or people or, or just a choice of, of kind of how to go forward in a much more minor way. Okay, let's begin dreaming. So as you close your eyes, you notice that everything around you is taken on a lemony hue and that the colours that you would normally see are slightly tinted as if, as if you're looking at a film stock that's had yellow grading put over it and the greens become kind of chartreuse or limey greens and the purples become much more opulent by contrast and the reds take on a hint of orange because they've got that lemon undertone and everything seems a little brighter and livelier, more saturated because of this lemon vibe. And it's the colour that you notice first. And you're stood in a building that is extremely luxurious. The fabrics are soft, the floors are marble, the walls are covered in rich colours and tapestries. Everything is very indulgent, very wealthy looking, very rich. And you can relax in this place, but there is a sense of wealth and stateliness and a kind of beautiful stillness about the place you're in. And you notice that in amongst the fixtures and fittings that have a metallic sheen to them or reflective surfaces. The thing that reflects back to you, even if it's not the thing in front of the object, is a lemon yellow, a kind of lemon verging into gold. And you find that interesting. You find it kind of magical that a place can reflect back to you something which you can't even really see. So as you walk through this room, you can hear somewhere the sound of running water. It's very calming. It's like the sound of a fountain rather than a stream. It's very regulated, very balanced. And it's just a trickle at this point. It's actually quite quiet. But it's discernible enough to know that the water is nearby. And that confuses you a little because there's nothing in this room that would suggest water or a fountain. And it makes you think of things flowing from one end to another. Or from a point of being at the very bottom of something to the top and down again and back up. And that makes you think of the balance that can be held between the choices that you need to make. Of the continuous flow of energy in one direction and then the equal flow of it in another. And the ease of this flowing water sound actually reminds you that you don't need to stress out in this place. You can let the sound of the water carry you as if you're being carried down a stream or a river. And you can drift towards all the beautiful objects in this room and gaze at them for as long as you'd like and get a real sense of balance and as I say a kind of stateliness, a feeling of wealth. And as you're looking at all these beautiful things and you're hearing this sound of running water from somewhere somewhere you can't see, perhaps somewhere magical. You get a smell wafting towards you and it's the smell of water. It's the smell of this 
fountain or river. And it's not the smell of water in a stagnant way. It's not mildewy. It's not swampy. It's, it's just like the smell of a lake on a summer night with the moon reflected in it. It's a cold smell, a smell of stillness, a smell that implies a depth to the water. And it makes you feel calm and emotionally at ease. It makes you think of how the surface of something like a lake can be so still even when so much is going on underneath it. And that kind of calm, that kind of stillness is true for you here and now. And then you notice that along with this smell in this beautiful room, there's a kind of tang, a taste that suddenly hits your mouth, a coppery sensation, a little bit like what would happen if you bit down on a coin or tasted coins. It's weird. You don't know where that came from or why it would be associated with water. But it serves as a kind of reminder in your body that just in the way that the calmness of the water smell and the vision of the lake that you had for a second when you smelled it gave you a sense that Emotionally speaking, you could reach the absolute pinnacle of however you want to feel and that you could reach a place of total joy and calm and peace simultaneously. You can also reach a point where you feel, in terms of money, like you always have enough. And it may surprise you to know that the person who owns this room that you're in, the king, if you like, whose house this opulent place is, got to the position that he could afford all of this beautiful stuff and he could live in this luxurious environment from the same position in which you're standing. He started out in the same career as you are, at the moment and with the same amount of wealth and a very similar family background and he worked his way up in the way that you're looking forward to working your way and before long with this attitude of opulence and enjoyment and appreciation for all the little things that he could add to his world and all the little things that he could add to the lives of the people around him he built up to the stage where he could afford to be in this place. And that's why you've been allowed to come in now and have a look around. Because this little dream you're having is not just a dream, it's a place you're experiencing. And the reason it's happening to you is to show you what's possible right from where you are. And so as this taste in your mouth, this copperiness, reminds you of all of this stuff and this revelation hits you with this physical sensation, you start to feel more capable. You start to feel that the ease with which you make your next set of choices will be just as simple as floating down a river or is the flow of water in a fountain. And this realization brings about a physical sensation in your body. And I'd like you to pinpoint where that is. It may feel like a tingling, an aliveness, a sense of preparedness, a strength that you didn't know was there. And it may be in a place in your body that you find surprising, 
perhaps a tingling forehead or a sparkling in a tailbone or a feeling of delight and joy expressing through your chest. It could even be in an elbow, but you find where it is and I want you to settle your awareness of your body and your sense of this place and of this particular experience into that zone and into that physical sensation. And by doing that, you have something that you can carry with you. And each time you return to that place in your body or you're reminded of it or you feel a little bit tingly, you'll also get the sensation that you can do anything you set your mind to and that your future is just as bright and lively and lemony for you as this place for this man who owns this house. And as you're feeling and thinking about this, I want you to look at the wall ahead of you and see two doors. And I want you to notice that one of the doors, your preferred door, has a plaque on it with a triangle that's pointing towards the floor and that where the triangle is engraved into the door, again, the surface of it being metallic, reflects the lemon hue. And I want you to notice that on the other door, there's also an identical plaque with one small difference. And that is that the triangle on the other door points upwards and some of you will recognise at this point that one is a triangle of water and one is a triangle of fire. And as you observe this, I want you to feel in your body how those two things interrelate and feel. And then, with the self-assured confidence that you've built and the sense that you are inventive and capable and that your path ahead is very exciting indeed I want you to go through the water door with the downward pointing triangle and in the room through the water door you see the source of the noise that you are hearing and the source of the lovely smell of the water. You see a giant fountain. And as the water goes up through the centre of the fountain, unseen, and down out of the spout of the fountain, and falling back into the calm pool at the bottom, I want you to think again of the fact that your choices can run in both directions and that you don't need to be trapped in moving in one direction or the other. I want you to understand that like the water, you are free to flow in whatever direction you choose and meet your vessel as you go. And stood behind this fountain, close enough to see clearly and close enough to be reflected in this pool is a trickster, a beautiful, smiling, warm trickster who emanates a sense of familiarity and friendship for you, as well as a bit of unpredictability and excitement. You never quite know what they're going to do next. And this trickster at first has a face that's not dissimilar to your own. There's a definite similarity in bone structure and in the size of your features and the placement. And you also notice that you're actually a similar height with similar hair and that the way they've chosen to dress, if you look down, 
is the same as the clothes that you're wearing. And then as you look up at their face again, I want you to notice that it starts to kind of flicker into other things. Kind of like they're wearing a scramble suit or some kind of iridescent cover. And they move into one thing and they move into another, like reflections in rippling water. And their face is changeable. And in one moment they're the trickster that you saw, and in the next they're you, even more accurately you. And in the next, they continue smiling, but they look like a smiling fox, or maybe a coyote. And then in the next flicker, they go back to the trickster that you saw originally. And in the next, you see a little bit of, is that a crow? And so on. And their face changes, and you see a clown here, and an animal here and a person you love who makes you laugh and then back to their original face. Until eventually, this undulating, opalescent, flickering quality to them begins to settle and still. And you see that actually, as it becomes more rigid, as it becomes more fixed in reality, it forms a mask. And then very slowly, cautiously enough that you feel safe and slowly enough that you can really observe it happening, the trickster lifts their hand and pulls the mask down from their face and you see what they really look like. And you're aware that this is a very great honor and that it's very, very, very rare for a person to see the trickster's real face. And you start to ask them why it is that they would show you. But before they can answer in words, you already get a sense from them that the reason they're showing you their face is because of your unique gifts, your perspective, your ability to be a trickster yourself to go from one thing to the other and then to find a middle ground in every situation that takes the best of both worlds. The trickster is a master of the third way, of the third path between two extremes or two binaries or polarities. And the trickster sees in you a gift for imagining what this third possibility is in every situation and that's why they've chosen to show you who they are in the hope that you'll show others who you are. I want you to look down now into the well at the bottom of the fountain, the pool that's very very calm that the water flows into. And I want you to focus at the point where the trickster's face is reflected, which is distant enough from where the water hits to be still and calm and quiet. And then I want you to reach out your left hand and touch the surface of this calming water. And as you touch it, I want you to observe that you can no longer see the trickster face or the mask and that the water around your finger starts to become black. Almost as if you've poured cordial into a glass and it's spreading out and infiltrating very, very slowly. But there's no need to be alarmed by this and it's perfectly natural. And as you watch the blackness coil out from your fingertips and spread around and gradually make the water dark in the same way as a hush of night falling, I want you to recognize that this blackness pouring out of you is the feeling that you had 
of being trapped, of being imprisoned in your choices or your life, of being stagnant in where you were and not being able to move forward. And that this sensation and this feeling and this thought is ready now to leave your body through your hand because you've met with the trickster and you know now that you're free. You're liberated from this mindset because you can adapt and you have more capability, eloquence, intelligence and gifts for the world than you ever thought possible before this meeting. Essentially, this is leaving your body because you're ready for the next thing. And as it leaves you and it goes into the water, the water flows back up the centre of the fountain unseen. And by the time it reaches the top, it's clear again. Whatever you had that was trapping you where you were has been recycled, dispersed, dissolved into the water and sent back out into the world in a new way. Now the thing that you'll take back from this experience into your everyday life is represented by a magician. Whether you know it and acknowledge it and live it or not, you yourself are a magician. Because the things that you will and the things that you manifest and visualise and the things that you don't give much thought to but just wish and act on and forget about come into physical existence, physical reality. And the trickster has also recognised in you that you're a person who's very adept with all the tools at your disposal. You know where your resources are and you take a little bit of one thing and a little bit of another thing from your life in a very eclectic and unusual way. And you can combine those in whatever way you fancy to will something new and beautiful into existence. So I want you to stand with the trickster for a little while longer and I want you to know as you raise one hand to the sky and one hand to the fountain pool and to the earth below you that you are a lightning rod for consciousness for excellent ideas that these things from the world of dreams and daydreams seem to transmit to you somehow and mull over in your mind and then be sent out into the world with such electricity as to delight everybody you come into contact with. And I want you to take that position of being a conduit for wonderful things and take the awareness that you're now liberated from the way that you used to feel and use it to have a chat with the trickster about what to do next. Hello, Pile 3. <laughs> Are you ready to dream a little dream? <laughs> I'm going to pop your crystal just on here. This card here is the uh, theme for your daydream. I haven't seen it yet, so I'm as excited as you are. <laughs> this card is a kind of signifier of who you are and who I will be relating to in my chat, which will help me to sort of focus the intention. And then 
This card is the colour that's going to permeate your daydream and this will act as a kind of anchor for you so that if you need to go back to the dream space at any point and relive things and reinforce things, you have a colour reminder, a visual reminder of where you were that will kind of spread throughout the thing and, and really just, yeah, anchor it to you. And then after we do the colour, these are the rest of the cards and these will be um, read out sequentially in a very improvised, uh, meditative, daydreamy kind of a way. Now, there are two ways to receive this. If you want to close your eyes and visualise the dream with me as I speak, that's great. And I will do it at a speed that makes that possible and at a volume that makes that possible. But if you aren't a fan of my voice or you know that there's a kind of ambient sounds that's going to put you off, um, anything like that, and you just want to hear what the dream is and go off and have it later by yourself, that's absolutely fine. And you're entitled to privacy with your daydreams. And I hope that whichever way you choose, it's a wonderful and fulfilling experience for you. So your particular daydream has a focus of reconciliation. I'm feeling for some of you that that will come as a surprise actually, that you had an idea of what you were here to dream about and that that's not it, but this is what I'm getting for you. So I imagine that it will be very useful indeed. And as a signifier card for kind of who I'm speaking to, we've got the Page of Cups. So instantly I know that the people who've picked this pile are very romantic, imaginative, idealistic, quite childlike, but in the best possible way, and have perhaps been labelled as naive by the outside world for their lack of cynicism. But just know if you're coming into this daydream space as quite a dreamy and quite a Neptunian and imaginative person, that I'm not going to judge you for how dreamy you are. I actually think that this thing that's been labelled naivety is a strength with you. Your idealism is your strength. And it's wonderful to dream and on some level you've found this reading because you recognise that and you want to reclaim your kind of daydreaming self and your idealising self from anybody a little bit too grounded who's perhaps told you that it's not appropriate because it is, <laughs> okay? And the colour we'll be working with throughout your daydream today, oh wow, is brilliance. Discover your sparkle, it says. So we're thinking in terms of sparklingness, we're thinking of glitter, which is quite appropriate, I feel. We're thinking in terms of iridescence and um, opalescent qualities, anything that reflects and refracts light. So I imagine that whatever imagery comes about organically from me looking at these cards, light will be a major theme and reflectiveness will be a major theme. And if perhaps it starts to come up in your life after you've had this particular daydream or visualisation, it's definitely kind of calling you to this theme and to whatever happens when we go there. I don't know where we're going to go. <laughs> it, it's really exciting for me, actually, because we're going to go on a journey together that is a complete mystery and, and maybe really transformative. So if you enjoy this process, and if anything comes up for you during the daydream that is unexpected or outside the realm of what I'm saying and including, you know, something more specific or something that happens that I'm not even talking about and it's just going on at the same time, please, please, please mention it in the comments so that, as I said in the intro, we can all swap daydreams and we can all learn what each other's nuances and combinations are. Because the more we reinforce these dream spaces, the more vivid a place we have collectively to go back to, to draw upon them as a resource and to kind of build ourselves up from the position that we're in now to where we want to be and what we want to manifest. Okay, I hope you're ready to dream.
So I want you to imagine yourself in darkness with a sparkler in your hand. And this is a magic sparkler, so it won't burn down, it won't run out. Burning brightly and brightly and brightly and it keeps going like that with no real change. But it's also the kind of sparkler that when you use it to write in the air or draw in the air or make sigils if that's your way of doing things, that these images that are made out of light and are usually so brief with regular sparklers, they stay put in the air for a little while longer. They hang there and you can layer them up, layer upon layer, and you can try that now if you like. You can draw and you can write and these things will hang in the air, lit from within. And as you use your sparkler, in whatever way you feel is the most appropriate for this little daydream, you can see from the light that the sparkler writings, the sparkler drawings are producing that actually you're stood in what seems to be a quite large metal cage. And that beyond that cage, there are shapes in the darkness, but they're not yet fully discernible to you. Even by writing with the sparkler a little closer to where they are, it doesn't seem like you can fully see them. And you feel safe in this place, and you see that the bars are reflecting the light from your sparkler and, and kind of from you as well. But you can't really see beyond it other than to know that you're in an unusual place and a safe place for you. So I want you to enjoy for a moment writing things in the air and spinning round and creating circles of light and whatever you'd like to do with this magic sparkler while it's in your possession. And while you do that, I want you to listen out as well as looking at the light. Because in the distance, there's a male voice. And the closer you listen to it, the more you realise that he's singing to himself quite badly. <laughs> and he's singing a song that you know really well. And it's the song that's perfect for him to be singing so badly because actually it's the song, you know the song, that you sing to yourself whenever you feel like there's no one listening. And it's got that little patch in it, that little note that barely anybody can reach in sequence. And it's so hard to get to that it's your little private song that you like to return to and try. And it delights you and amuses you far off somewhere in the distance that you can't yet see this little man is singing his little song he's terribly out of tune you can tell that he thinks that no one's listening at all and actually it's beautiful to hear him it's like opening up on somebody's private world and you're so glad that he doesn't think you're listening because his singing is really unreserved and you almost want to join in. And I want you to pinpoint in your body this rising amusement that you have over this badly singing dude. <laughs> I want you to feel the flutter of laughter as it bubbles up and you try to stifle a giggle. And I want you to note to yourself where it is in your body where humour lies in you and what it feels like. Is it tingly? Is it like a little moth sensation? Or is it more of a, a slow burn or a heaviness? And as you're listening and as you're watching your sparkler and watching the light dance around you, I want you to notice that as well as the sound of the singing man, there's a weird smell, a kind of greenhouse smell, 
like plants or herbs or something tropical growing in a distance. It's not an unpleasant smell, but it's very, very pungent. Almost as if there's a secret garden full of vines and herbs and all sorts of lovely things. Just out of reach, just out of your vision, maybe just beyond where this voice is coming from. And as you smell this greenhouse smell of plants, and it gets stronger and stronger for you, there's a weird taste that comes to your palate with the smell. A taste that doesn't match the smell of the plants. Oddly, it tastes like your favourite street food. It tastes like how it is to be in the city. And you think back to a time where you were walking down a street and there was a vendor on a corner selling your absolute favourite thing. And you bought some food from them and you let it settle down into your stomach. And the taste on your tongue that goes with this greenhouse scent tastes like that food. And the sauces and the texture is the same. And it's a very odd sensation for you. But with the taste, you also feel the deep feeling of satisfaction that came to you when the food went down, down, down into your stomach. And the sensation of pleasant heaviness that it left there, of an emptiness being filled just the right amount. And I want you to know that that sensation of satisfaction from the food that you didn't even really just eat is available to you all the time and can be accessed easily by coming back to this place and smelling this strange smell and the taste of being satisfied. And as you're feeling that sensation of heaviness, I want you to notice in your stomach that it starts to become a little bit more warm, a little bit more fluttery. And then the sensation rises through your body, back up and into your chest. And where it was a digestive satisfaction, it becomes a deep happiness, a deep warmth, with a similar quality to it, to the feeling of suppressed laughter that you had when you were listening to the song in the distance. But it's bigger, it's brighter. It's actually very, very powerful and it's getting broader and broader. And as you look down, you can see your own heart, your own chest glows, kind of like E.T. <laughs> and that you're emanating this warmth through this sense of pleasure and laughter and enjoyment that is coming through you. Like you have a sun perched in your rib cage and it's glowing out through your skin, burning bright and feeling deliciously illuminating and fun and childlike. And if you like at this moment and if it feels right for you, when you have this light burning bright from deep inside you, you can choose to embody your childhood self, to shrink a little and have your limbs get a little smaller and become yourself at your favourite stage of childhood. And if that's not the case for you, you feel a sense of giggliness, exuberance, childlike joy, a sense of little creatures playing, delight at the world. And your sparkler is still in your hand, but there is so much light pouring out of you that it's almost insignificant to look at the sparkler now because you are the source of the brilliance that's happening. And as this sunlight, this brilliance, this happiness, this sunflower quality that's emanating from you hits the bars of the cage around you, 
you see that their surface is slightly sheer and it reflects the light back. But you also see that the space beyond them is becoming illuminated. And as that gets brighter and brighter, you notice that you're actually in your favourite place. The cage has been planted there so that you can experience being there. And on the other side of the cage, now illuminated fully by the light that comes from you and from inside you, a figure is in the distance and walking towards you. And as they get closer, you see them and you see that they are the person that you have chosen to reconcile with. It could be an aspect of yourself, it could be a loved one. It could be someone unexpected. But as they come into focus in the distance, you realise that even though you're seeing them and you're feeling a little bit tense about how that might go, the light emanating from you is brighter than ever. And the area that's illuminated by it is broader than ever. And you can see right into the distance. And as the person gets closer and closer, they start to get smaller. They start to become their childhood self. And it's the magic of this place and of this situation and of you holding the sparkler and being the sun that's doing this. And actually, as they look at you and as they approach, you see that they're smiling. And you feel, to your surprise, that you're smiling too. That you can look at each other as child companions, as children together, in a spirit of joy and a spirit of playfulness. And as they approach, they choose to stand in front of the bars of the cage on the other side from you. And as they smile at you, you see that a light is coming from them as well as you. And there's a deep sense of warmth between you. And actually, there's no need to say anything to each other. There's no need to mend the situation that was. There's no reassurance required about where one or the other is at. And there's no animosity or antagonism between you at all. There's just this shared sense of, wow, we're really lucky to be here, aren't we? And an undercurrent of deep, deep love for each other. For the fact that you both stepped into each other's lives at exactly the right time, in exactly the right ways, to help each other along to learn the things that you needed to learn and be the people that you needed to be. And there is, in a way, no need for forgiveness between you. There's no need to bring the two points together into one because they always were. You were always unified, always interlinked, always points on a spectrum that goes far beyond you both and is filled with such light that it would be brighter than all of the suns of all of the people on earth. Simultaneously, you and your person look up and you see something begins to fall. You look through the bars, the rungs of your cage, and they look up into the sky. And these little flecks of things are reflecting the brilliance that's coming from you both. But as they get closer, you start to recognise what they are. And you both suppress a laugh again. Because out of nothing, out of this place and this scenario that should not have such things in it, there is snow. 
falling slowly and beautifully and silently onto where you both stand together now. And for every snowflake, every little clump that edges its way further down through the sky, closer and closer and towards where you are now. And every bit of that that touches your cage, the part of the cage that it touches seems to dissolve, seems to vibrate and then disappear almost into thin air. And you see that actually the parts of the cage that are visibly disintegrating are going back down into the earth below your feet. Until eventually you stand with the person you are fully reconciled with and you are no longer a person in a cage that felt a little safer, a little more comforting than being out in the open. You are instead exposed and out in your favourite place, stood with one of your favourite people in the snow. And as you look at them and exchange a look that communicates the wonder of this situation, the impossibility of all these things stacked together, you see that you're both wearing crowns, like little kiddie dress-up tiaras, <laughs> very suitable for your childlike selves. And that makes you smile more. And you notice that in every place that there has been snowfall around your feet and that your cage is disintegrated into dust and then into earth and then gone back into the ground where it belongs to be recreated as something else. There are now little green shoots popping up out of the ground as if the conflict or the disharmony that was there that has died off has disintegrated and returned to the earth and in its place there is a garden sprouting. And gradually as you watch these little saplings and little sprouts get higher and higher by your toes, you realise that the smell, the greenhouse smell that you could detect before was coming from somebody else, perhaps the singing man, at a great distance having this same experience, having this reconciliation with a person or an aspect of self that he cared deeply about and letting the afraid parts of him disintegrate and become fertilizer for something new and beautiful. And that that little garden that he started to grow by his toes became the strong and healthy plants that left the scent that blew on the wind and arrived with you. And I want you to understand for a moment as you enjoy the snow in this little growing garden and your friend in front and the openness of this your favourite place that there are so many people having this experience simultaneously in places just distant enough from each other that we can hear each other singing silly songs and we can smell the plants growing up in each other's path but we can't necessarily see each other doing this thing having this process happen and I want you to imagine these people all over the world as tiny lights, just like your chest burns with this beautiful, joyous, childlike light that shines on the plants and helps them grow. I want you to realise 
that all of these lights of all of these people in the process of deep reconciliation are like tiny stars visible from a long way away if you have the right way to see them and you yourself burn brighter and brighter and the light and the joyousness and the laughter that was building up in your chest starts to flow to other parts of your body and with every breath of the very clean air and with every beat of your heart pulsating into each muscle and each limb it gets brighter and spreads further until the light from you is so bright that everything is brilliance everything looks glittery sparkly bright reflective and the person that you came to reconcile with laughs and laughs at how wonderful this process is and how much you've become a beacon of light a star amongst many stars in a very bright world and I want you to revel in this brightness together and enjoy it and contemplate the brightness of every other soul living through this experience as you hold hands and enjoy the sensation of being in your favorite place together and you can speak to each other further if you like or you can just stand in the appreciation of each other and of all living things and my voice is going to leave you here but I invite you to come back anytime you like and to let your garden grow.